Allumage moteur Vulcan. Allumage moteur Vulcan. Welcome to the Exploratorium, where tonight I'll take you to Comet Rosetta, uh, the Comet Churyumov Drasimenko with the Rosetta spacecraft, actually. And we'll take a look at it. I'll show you the latest images and tell you a little bit about the mission. So I'm Paul Doherty, and I'm a senior scientist at the Exploratorium, and I'm also a planetary physicist. So it was a nice conjunction of science in the museum and science for real. So the spacecraft, the Rosetta spacecraft, it's going to be the, it's the, it has already rendezvoused last week with the comet. It is right there. It's 60 miles, 100 kilometers from the comet, flying along right beside it. It's going to be the first spacecraft to orbit a comet, and it's going to send down a lander to land on the comet and stay there. So th those are the three firsts combined for this particular mission. Now, it's had a, quite a mission already. It's been up there 12 years, and this shows you that what it's been doing. It's launched in, in uh, well, it's 10 years, 2004 it launched, but they didn't have a powerful enough rocket to get it out to where this comet is. This comet is out beyond Mars right now. And they had to match orbits with it. So they had to actually fly it around and zip around the Earth and use the Earth's gravity to give it a boost. And then again, then it flew out to Mars and they used Mars's gravity to give it a boost. And then they did Earth again. And that threw them out enough they were in the asteroid belt and they met an asteroid named Steens on the way. And then they fell back in and they gave another boost from the Earth and finally it had enough energy to get out and rendezvous with the comet 67P. It's the 67th periodic comet ever discovered. It was discovered by two Ukrainian scientists, Churyumov and Gerasimenko. And if you discover a comet, you get to name it for yourself. So that's a good reason to get out there with a telescope and find comets. So after all of that, here is this Rosetta spacecraft out there just rendezvousing with a comet. Oops, sorry, I hit the wrong button there. <laughs> um, so where is it now? So in the upper right of this scene here, it just rendezvoused August 2014. It rendezvoused with a comet. I'll show you the images in a minute. In November, it's going to have a part of itself break off. It's called the Philae lander, and it's going to land on the comet. And then the two, the orbiting spacecraft and the lander, are going to fall with the comet towards the sun as the comet turns on, begins to erupt particles into space, has a tail, and then comes in not as close to the sun as the Earth. It'll, it'll always be further from the sun than the Earth. And then it will, after a year, depart and head to interstellar space again, head out beyond Mars, and we'll see how long the mission can last beyond that. All right, so as we are approaching the comet, this image shows you the first time we saw the comet turn on. So if you look at this image, you'll see stars, and there's one fuzzy star out there, a star with hair, and coma is Greek for hair. And so that's the comet. That's where they're trying to go. In this photo, the spacecraft is traveling a, a thousand miles an hour towards the comet, and it wants to get to the comet and stop. So it has a little bit of work cut out for it. So here's how it stops. It's got four rocket engines on it, and it fired those rocket engines for eight hours. It was the longest rocket engine burn forever for the European Space Agency. Now, each of those rocket motors gives a thrust equal to the weight of this one liter water bottle on Earth. That's, we call that 10 newtons in physics. That's the thrust, and they had four of those engines. So I'm going to start out by just passing that around. You can feel the thrust. Now, the thing is, this spacecraft, when it was launched, weighs as much as an F SUV. So you're pushing on this SUV going 1,000 miles an hour with this little push that's as much weight as a four water bottles. So no wonder it took eight hours to slow it down. Okay? However, you know, in those 1960s movies about spies, the thing they were always trying to steal was the recipe for the rocket fuel. Well, this rocket fuel that they're using, and half the weight of the SUV was fuel. 
and it's a nasty combination. It's called hypergolic. And these two chemicals, monomethylhydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, when they touch each other, they burst into flame. They are called, that hypergolic means the two liquids, when they touch, explode. You don't need a spark plug. This engine just works, and that's what you want when you're trying to rendezvous with a comet out in space. You want an engine that's just gonna work. And it's been working great. So, what they did was they matched speeds with the comet, and the next thing they're gonna do is orbit the comet. And that's what they're doing right now. So here's the European Space Agency's view of what they're gonna do. And I'll narrate it for you because this is a silent movie. So, as they arrived on the 6th of August, they fired their engine. Every time you see it take a turn, it's firing its engines. Because the gravity of this comet is so low, it can't hold the spacecraft in orbit right now. It has to use its rocket motors to orbit. It's a power orbit, never been done before. And that's why the orbit looks triangular. You've never seen a triangular orbit before. Now, after they orbit once and get good pictures of the comet, they're gonna lower the orbit to 50 kilometers from 100. Okay, they're gonna go from 30 miles to 15 miles. And then, after that, after they go around one more time, then they're gonna get down to 30 kilometers. That's about 20 miles, about 20 miles. And at 20 miles, the gravity of the comet is strong enough to hold it in orbit. And so you'll see on the picture here that it's going in an arc of a circle. But they're gonna interrupt their orbit after half an orbit and send it the, the uh, spacecraft off at 90 degrees because they wanna map the entire comet. They want a really good map because they wanna land on the comet. And so they've gotta find a landing place and that's really hard. And then after that, they're just gonna keep lowering the orbit closer and closer to this comet. And this comet is about the, between two and four kilometers, maybe a, about a um, mile and a half uh, across. And they'll get really close. They'll get to within a couple kilometers of this comet and then they're gonna drop the fillet lander. They're just gonna drop it and let it fall to the surface, and we'll see what happens later. So the spacecraft is solar powered. It's, it's out beyond Mars. So it has these gigantic solar panels. They're 100 feet from tip to tip and six feet wide. And even with that gigantic set of solar panels, they only gather 850 watts. That's like 900 watt light bulbs. On the roof of the Exploratorium, we power this museum with solar cells. We have 1.3 million watts of solar panels up there. That's megawatts. This is 850 watts. So um, here it is coming in, approaching the comet. This, this was long ago. This was in July. And you can see the fake images of the comet here, what they expected to see. They expect, you know, there's this fuzzy little blob. It's getting bigger at the end of July, okay? And, and we're gonna get on towards August. And this is what they expected to see when they got near the comet. That's what, that's what their guess was, what the comet would look like. This is what it actually looks like. It, uh, so it, it's, it's been described as a duck, a rubber duck. But it's a rubber duck that's been beaten by some sadistic child it's pockmarked, it's just a strangest shaped thing. So all the scientists now have to drop a spacecraft, the Phil A lander, onto this thing. They have to do a ton of calculations to figure out which way down is. Can you imagine dropping into that narrow canyon and half the spacecraft is pulling you one way and ha half the comet is pulling you one way and half the comet's pulling you the other way? Which way is down? They have to calculate that for this odd duck of a comet in order to drop that fillet lander onto the surface safely. And that's gonna be quite a job. And they have to do it by early November. They have a deadline because in mid-November, this comet is going to turn on. It's gonna start spouting fountains of gas that drive particles out into space, particles that could kill the lander. 
they actually would like to land the lander near a giant geyser coming from the comet, but they want to make sure they don't land in the geyser, and they don't want to be killed by the geyser on the way down. So it's, it, this is a really chancy operation. And so November 4th to 11th is when I think they're going to land, and it'll be our, we'll do another webcast, and that'll be an exciting time for us in the planetary physics community. So how big is this comet? Well, this slide was obviously made by Europeans. It's smaller than Mount Blanc and bigger than Mount Olympus. <laughs> but for you Californians, uh, Mount Olympus is about the same height as um, Mount Whitney. So this comet stacked end to end is bigger than Mount Whitney. Okay, that's a nice size. It uh, goes around the sun once in six and a half years. So six and a half years to go around once. It's been around several times already. Its um, radius is two kilometers or one and a half miles. It's got a mass of three billion tons. Okay, it's a, a good mass. You wouldn't want to have to move that out of your driveway. And it rotates once every 12.7 hours. This comet is rotating at the speed of an hour hand on a clock. Okay, it goes around once in 12 hours. You're going to see animations at the end today where I'll show you an an the actual photos time lapse showing the rotation of the comet. And it's going to show you the comet rotating in a minute. And you have to realize it's really rotating in 12 hours. OK, now here are the latest images of this comet. And as you look at that, you see it's got this dark region at one end. That's probably a crater. You know, when we looked at the moon back in the 1950s, there was a gigantic argument. Was the moon covered with craters that were made by impacting meteorites? Or was the moon covered with volcanoes that erupted outward? And that's the very question we have on this comet. The structures that you see there, the circular-like structures, are those structures impact craters? Or are those structures volcanic-like eruptions? They wouldn't be volcanoes. They wouldn't have molten liquid material. They'd be the ice of the comet turning into gas, subliming, and blasting out a hole in the surface. And that's one of the things we'll learn from this mission. How was that surface carved? Here's another one rotated around a little bit. I can see that uh, the next Star Wars, they're going to actually copy this and fly the spacecraft into the hole on the end. It's going to be hollow. There's going to be a beast in there. But, but notice, they're going to try to land something on this. To land it, they're looking for a, a smooth place. They don't want to land it on a rock. They want to land it level. And so as you watch these images, see if you can find a place that you would land on this comet. Here's the, here's the ass end, maybe there in the middle, uh, the, the butt of the comet. There is that smooth plane there that you can see. That might be a good place to land. <coughs> Some of those cliffs that you see in the shadow are 150 meters high, 450 feet high. And I'm a rock climber. Uh, that's a nice height. but. On this comet, you can jump off the top of a 450-foot cliff and just land gently on the surface, no problem at all. So it's, it has its, its low gravity advantages. Here it's rotated a little bit further around. Remember, you're looking for a place to land on this thing. And uh, there it is. It's got this neck. One of the great questions on this comet is, was it two comets that stuck together, or was it one comet that was eroded away into this funny duck shape? We don't know. We'll try to find out. And here it is close up. This is, the, this is the picture from just yesterday. And look at the detail in the cliff on the neck, the cliff next to the neck. You can see these lineations, these linear details. And in the neck itself, those little dots, those are house-sized boulders. So if they tried to land the spacecraft in that neck, it would probably crash into the house-sized boulders. So it's a real problem. OK, so I had questions about this comet. And so I went to my friend, Google, and I looked up the interesting things. And they didn't tell me, but I'm a physics professor. So I can answer my own questions if I wasn't lazy. So the first thing I did was I took the mass of the comet and the volume of the comet, and I found out its density. And it turns out, when I calculated the density of this comet, it's a tenth the density of water ice. It's like powder snow made into a snowball or a dry sponge. 
So if you were to grab a handful of that comet material, that might be what it feels like. So that we can tell. We know the size, we know the mass. We're going to know the mass a lot better in a week because now we're falling around this comet. And as we measure the fall, it tells us the gravity, and the gravity tells us the mass. So I'll be able to get a much better answer for you next week, but I can get this answer today. Isaac Newton. Thank you, Isaac. Um, I had some questions about this comet, and what I really wanted to find was, what's it like standing on the surface? What's gravity on the surface of this comet? And it turns out gravity on this comet is five millionths of the gravity on Earth, five microgravities. And what that means is that if I were to drop something from one meter standing on the surface of this comet, it would take two minutes to fall to the surface. Two minutes. I was trying to make a demo for you where I could actually drop something and have it take two minutes to reach. That's really hard to do. I couldn't do it. I failed. But maybe next time I'll do it. <laughs> so that's really something. They're going to drop the Philae spacecraft from a couple kilometers up, and it's going to fall to the surface. And by the time it reaches the surface, it's going to be going one meter per second. That's two miles an hour. That's how fast you walk. So when this spacecraft hits this comet, it's going to be like you walking at your normal walking pace into a wall. Bang! So they put shock absorbers on it. And we'll take a look at those in a little bit. All right, something else. The t-shirt says, I think I found a way out of here. And to a scientist, that's the equation for escape velocity. And you can calculate how fast do you have to go to jump off this comet and never come back. That's called escape velocity. And when I calculate that, it's half a meter a second or one mile an hour. What that means is you're an you're a astronaut and you've landed on this comet. How hard do you have to jump to never come down again? What goes up must come down is not true. What goes up at less than escape velocity must come down is true. Escape velocity on this comet will be achieved if on Earth you jump one half an inch. If you jump one half an inch high, if you use that same energy on this comet, you would never come down. You would go off to infinity. It's a very light mass. It's very fluffy, and, and you can jump away from it. Um, even better, what is the orbital velocity at the surface? Let's say you wanted to be Iron Man or Superman and actually leap out and fly around the comet, okay? Orbital velocity is 0.7 square root of 2 times escape velocity. And so that is 0.3 meters per second, about 0.6 miles an hour. If you just take a nice gentle leap forward at about enough to jump 3 quarters of an inch, 2 thirds of an inch, you will skim over the surface of the comet in orbit, going around. It would, you know, it's like you are from Krypton. <laughs> You're actually from the Earth. I mean, you are so overpowered for living on this comet, you, you would not believe. You can jump into orbit. You can jump away. It's just a great place. One slight problem, this comet is actually rotating in every 12 hours and it's two kilometers in radius. The surface velocity, if you calculate the surface velocity, it's 0.27 meters per second. The surface is almost going fast enough to be in orbit. If we're going a little faster, and you put a rock on the surface and let go, the rock would float off the surface. And recently, like yesterday, scientists published an article in which they found a comet which was rotating fast enough that the surface velocity was higher than the orbit velocity. And, that and yet it was still held together. The rocks were still on the surface. That's a puzzle. And what they realized was there must be another force other than gravity holding those rocks onto the comet. And that other force is something called the van der Waals force. 
when you bring two molecules together. It's what geckos use to walk up glass walls. The little hairs on the pads of the feet of the geckos get close enough to the glass. The van der Waals force holds them on. And so on these comets, some of those rocks are being held on by the same force that holds geckos to walls. Don't tell that insurance agency about that. There'll be a commercial. All right. Okay. Um, when they go into orbit about the comet, which they're going to do, you saw that, it's going to be a 30 kilometer high orbit. And to do that orbit, it only takes three inches per second. The spacecraft has to move three inches every second to be in orbit. And that's so slow at that distance, it's going to take 23 days to go around once in an orbit. The moon takes 28 days to go around the Earth or so, depending on what, how you define month. Uh, but th that's really going to be slow. So they're going to keep lowering that and going faster and faster. And then they're going to land on the comet. So here's the fillet lander. It only weighs 100 kilograms, about 220 pounds, out of that whole weight. And here's what they're going to do. So here's the spacecraft flying over the surface of the comet. They're going to eject with springs this spacecraft. And what they're going to do, you'll notice, they ejected it backwards, so they stopped it. It was orbiting, and they threw it off backwards, and it stopped. And it, when it stopped, it's not in orbit anymore. It's going to just plummet to the surface. And it's going to deploy its shock absorber legs. And those little wands sticking out the side are radio antennas. Watch it, as it comes down, bang, those two red things, those are harpoons. They're going to harpoon the, mo the, the comet because they're worried about bouncing off. And then the legs just augured into the ice. They have ice augers to dig down all three legs. What they're doing now is they have six cameras on each side of the spacecraft. They're taking panoramic pictures, which you see building up on the lower left. Rather than having one camera that looked around, they just, cameras are so cheap these days, they just put six of them on there. And they're sending back the pictures. Um, the whole surface is covered with solar cells. They have batteries enough to run for 72 hours when they land. It's going to take them 8 to 12 hours to drop from the altitude of the spacecraft to the surface. And they're going to go around, take two sets of panoramas on this thing. And then, then they get down to work. Hopefully, it'll be in sunlight and we'll be able to generate its power. That, that, that lower camera that just flashed a picture underneath its feet, that's the one they're going to use to give you live television coverage of the landing. They're going to show it land on the comet November, early November. It'll be really good to watch. Here's the payload bay. And what's going to happen here is a couple things. So they just had a, a rod drop in. That's a drill. They're going to drill nine inches into the surface and pull up some of the surface to analyze in the chemistry inside. This thing here is really interesting. This is a hammer, and it's going to drill itself into the, into the comet. It's a self-drilling hammer, and that's a temperature probe. They're doing a probe of the comet. You don't want one of those. Um, and that thing that just lowered down, the last little thing was a alpha proton x-ray uh, photometer. So uh, what that's, what's that? So first of all, that drill is going to bring up samples of the comet. They're going to take those samples. They're going to put them in an oven. They're going to vaporize them. That oven can go to 800 degrees Celsius. And they're going to vaporize them. And then they're going to use the nose in that spacecraft, a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, to find out exactly what the inside of that comet is made from, OK? And that alpha particle x-ray spectrometer, they're going to find out what the surface is made of. They're going to shoot alpha particles in there, blast apart the atoms, and look at the, the fragments, and the x-rays that come out. The, um, and the thermal probe, when they drilled into the surface and stuck that temperature probe in, it's going to give them temperature versus depth. And that's going to tell them the heat flowing out of the comet or flowing into the comet from the sun. So they, this thing is instrumented to hell and gone. So it is a comet. Here's the comet. This is an overexposed image as they came in. And you can see it, has, it already has a tail. 
It's already shooting off particles. And I want to show you how you can do this at home. So if I can have my uh, cameraman here. What I've done is I've taken a planter tray and I filled it with room temperature water. He's going to show you. You'll be able to see it on the screen. Um, and what I'm going to do is I have used my mallet to break up dry ice into some small pieces. And I'm going to put, see, dry ice on Earth is like water ice on the comet, okay? Now, the, some of those pieces you'll see are floating, and the floating ones have jets coming out of them. One sank, and it's kind of bubbling, but it'll come up to the surface in a minute. I, I got one slightly too large. But, let me get that out of there. There we go. So, but notice the floating ones, and you can see the mist coming out in straight lines. What's happening here is that those straight lines are actually the carbon dioxide gas that came from the dry ice at a very cold temperature. And that gas is causing the water vapor to turn into droplets. So you can see the outgassing. Notice the one that's spinning in the right-hand corner. The water has formed a casing around the dry ice. And the dry ice is turning into a gas and it's leaking out of the casing in jets, which is spinning it. And so these jets can actually spin comets and can push them out of orbit a little bit. It's really spinning around there. And it's a nice way to model comets. One interesting thing is if I break this one up, the pieces skitter around. But if the pieces get anywhere near each other, I can get some near each other here. They will attract. And that's how comets are made in the first place, or planets. Solid particles out in space are attracting each other slightly gravitationally. But if they touch, they bond together. Solids bond together. And they make dust grains, which come together to make dust bunnies, which come together to make planetesimals, which come together to make comets. So this is a great model if you want to do it. Don't touch the dry ice with your hands. You notice I'm using the spoon. If you touch the dry ice for more than a few seconds, you'll get second degree frostbite. Don't do that. But it is kind of a fun way to actually experience what it's like on the comet. OK, so they've already started doing three experiments. Here's one of them. They're picking up pieces of the comet. The comet is already erupting. The gas is, is turning from solid to gas. I'm sorry, the comet is turning from solid to gas, blowing dust out. The spacecraft is flying through the dust. This is the, is the dust collector. In the upper right of this image, there's a plate. And that plate is gold, but it looks black. And it looks black because they did a, something really modern and really neat. They took the gold and they made it into particles the diameter of a human hair. That, that gold is in little balls. It's like balls of gold that are small enough that when light scatters from them, it looks black, not golden. And that layer of golden balls, when a dust particle hits it, it's like dropping a marble into a container of beans. It just goes crunch and stops. This device is there to stop the dust particles and catch them. And now they've caught them. They light this from the side, and there's this dust particle sitting on the surface of this gold. They have a linear accelerator on this thing. And the linear accelerator accelerates indium atoms to the speed of light, just about. They crash those into the dust particles, they vaporize them, and they use another gas chromatograph mass spectrometer to find out what they are. This is one of the tiny experiments that flew on this mission. What an amazing thing. Collect a dust particle from a comet, vaporize it. I mean, when you think about superheroes, they come to the Earth, they always have these powers, you know, X-ray vision. This thing has an alpha particle X-ray spectrometer. They have eyes that can vaporize things. This thing has a linear accelerator that shoots indium atoms that vaporize things. Don't mess with this spacecraft. It has another dust collector. This one, that little box, it has a mouth on it. There's two planes of laser light in that mouth. 
When a dust particle goes through one plane, it gives a flash of light. When it goes through the second plane, it gives another flash. It's a speedometer. It's a speed trap for dust particles. And then there's another collector. And when the particle hits that collector, it recoils. And the combination of the speed and the recoil tells us the mass of the particle. So that's an amazing thing. And finally, they have a thermometer that just looks at things and tells the temperature. And you can buy one of those today. This is an infrared thermometer. I just pointed at something like the floor, and it tells me it's 21 degrees Celsius. I pointed at that screen, and it tells me it's 29 degrees Celsius. I pointed at my forehead, and it tells me it's 32. I'm a little warm standing in front of you up here. <laughs> they looked at the comet already, and the comet was minus 90 Fahrenheit. That sounds cold, but it was warmer than they expected. <clears throat> they expected it to be much colder because they expected the comet would be covered in ice, but it's not covered in ice. It's covered in dust, leftover dust from previous eruptions. So we're already learning lots of things about this comet. So I'm gonna wrap it up here and I'll take your questions at the end and I'm gonna show you one other quick set of images here. So thank you for coming to the Exploratorium, learning about comets, and have a great night, and stay around if you want to ask questions. <laughs> so questions to start. Well, I... Anything you, you were in, inspired to ask about that comet? What causes comets to turn on? Yeah, just, so what causes comets to turn on? was the first question. And, and what happens is this comet is mostly water ice. And water ice at very cold temperatures, below minus 90 Fahrenheit. And that's a good solid ice. I mean, at those temperatures, water ice is harder than granite. In Antarctica, when water ice, when snow <laughs> blows at minus 40 Fahrenheit into granite, the, the snow grinds the granite away. So you, you're thinking of water ice like in your freezer. That's nothing. This is water ice that's hard as granite. And so it doesn't evaporate very well. But as this comes in to the Earth's distance from the sun, it's going to warm up to Earth temperatures. And we know what happens to water ice at Earth temperatures. It melts. Well, in space, it's not going to melt. It's water ice in space is dry ice. It, at those low pressures, it can't be a liquid. So it's going to turn into gas, and that's turning on the comet. So purely warming it up will, will make it evaporate. OK, I think there was a question back there. Yeah, I was wondering if the path, the orbital path that you showed, yeah. is that all pre-programmed in, or do they adaptively update that based on what they know now that they're there? Adaptively up update it. It takes 20 minutes for light to travel from the Earth to the spacecraft and 20 minutes to come back. So they can't control it in real time. What they have to do is they, they're now measuring like mad to find out the mass of this comet. Because uh, the spacecraft is bending because of the gravity of the comet. So pretty soon we'll know exactly what the mass is. And that will allow them in six days, uh, sorry, in three days, to actually fire the rockets for the first time to go to the next leg of the orbit. But they, they, have, uh, they have three whole days to make the measurement, adjust it, send up the command. 20 minutes later, it gets there, fire the engines. 20 minutes later, the signal comes back. It worked or it didn't. Yeah, it's adaptive. And they're working their butts off day and night. They are in the lab just cranking away. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Wait, wait, he'll get you the, the mic. Does the lander have its own propulsion system, or is the descent completely controlled by the springs when it gets ejected? Oh, that's a great question. So the, the lander was just dropped off by the springs, and it drops down to the surface. And when it gets near the surface, there are a couple of little tiny rocket motors on the top that give it a push. Because when it lands, the legs are going to be springy. And they worry about the springing of the legs, bouncing it back off. So they're going to put a little tiny burst of rocket motor at the very end to hold it down while the harpoons go into the surface and hold it down for good, they hope. But they don't know what that surface is. Does the surface have the consistency of cigarette ash? 
in which case the harpoons will do no good. Is the, is the surface actually rock? It's not. Uh, but you know, when the harpoons bounce off, those harpoons are designed for ice. So it's, it's a risky business getting down there. But the only motor they have is to hold it on the surface just briefly while the harpoons go in. Over there. Um, so how did they choose this comet as the, uh, the comet to land on? They didn't. They were going to a different comet. And uh, a smaller one would have been much easier, smaller, smoother, and everything. But they launched this comet on an Ariane's rocket uh, from French Guiana. And uh, 10 years ago, well, actually 12 years ago, they were having trouble with the Ariane rockets. They were failing one after the other. So they had to postpone the mission. And they had to postpone the mission for a couple of years while they figured out what was going wrong with their rockets. And by then, this other comet, Wurtonen, had moved out of the way. They couldn't get to it. So they scrambled to find another comet they could actually get to that might be the right size. And this was the best one, but it's bigger. Even as low as that gravity was that I was describing to you, it's still higher gravity. So they had to beef up the suspension on the fillet lander so it didn't get crushed when it plummeted into the surface. So this wasn't their first choice comet, but it's totally a cool comet. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I think what I'll do here is I'm going to call up, oops, I, uh, maybe I can't do that. I really want to, oops, uh, hmm. oh well. I was trying to show, I wanted to show you a, a GIF animation of the rotating comet, but I don't seem to have, oh, here we go. There I am. Let me go over here. Um, it's not letting me display. Um, I'm not being able to see my uh, control here. It's interesting, system preferences. Uh, okay, well, it's not, sorry about that. Can't get it up for you. Um, there it is. <laughs> it, it's, it's a low res anyway. But you can see, it's actually doing that in 12 hours. It's going around at the speed of an hour hand. And this is, when you see this animation online, just realize. And they're going to do another one with high res pictures soon. This, this was done a, a week ago. And that, that, that's the best picture we had a week ago. But um, that's, um, and so to do that calculation of what the gravity is in this odd shaped thing and the spinning on that weird shaped thing, it's going to be something to actually cause that lander to happen. Okay, other, other questions, things you wondered? Yes, over there. You mentioned they might find the surface very ashy. Yeah. Is they, are they concerned that they might not actually be able to land on it and they would just sink into it? If it's you betcha. That's exactly what they're worried about. You, you, should, you should advise them on the mission. They don't know if the surface is going to be hard as granite or softer than anything you could ever imagine and that the whole spacecraft will just vanish into the surface. That's the same worry that we had about landing on the moon. Some of the early, before they landed the first spacecraft on the moon, the surveyor lander, there was big worries that the moon was covered with this powdery dust and that lander would just disappear into the dust of the moon. They worry the same thing about the comet. My guess is it'll be the same answer as on the moon, that it will be hard enough to actually support the weight of the lander, but we'll never know until we do the first landing. So it's, it's the nature of science. We don't know the answer. We'll try to find out the answer, but we might not know. Uh, another question up here. So how long will the, uh, the comet last once it turns on? Is that going to be, is it going to burn itself out or is it going to go for a while? Or? So it's been around several times already. We don't know how many times it's been around the sun before. It's been around before. This, this comet's been around. Um, and and it, right now it's giving off. Or is that water bottle around? Someone have the water bottle? Oh, right there, okay, yeah, the water bottle. It's giving off a third of that water bottle in water every second. That's how much water it's losing. And it's got three billion tons of water. So, and, and as it comes into the sun, it's gonna start giving off more and more and more water. But it probably has enough water in it that will turn to gas to last for many more dozens of times around the sun. So we think that this one will just be a, a regular pass around the sun. It'll, its tail will start to grow. It's not going to be visible from Earth naked eye. 
Uh, but but the, the Rosetta spacecraft has got to have a phenomenal set of images of this comet with, with gas jets spouting out of it. I think I'm really looking forward to that, getting some movies, uh, 3D movies, because the spacecraft will be slowly changing its perspective. So we'll get 3D movies of erupting geysers on a comet, I hope. No, fingers crossed. Okay, other, other questions? Okay, if you have personal questions, come up, ask me later after the webcast is over. Uh, thank you very much for coming to the Exploratorium. Yeah.